Welcome. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we're going to continue to go through Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. Uh, we're going to look at verses 17 and 18 in this video. In the last video, we talked about 17, but we only focused on the fact of why it is that Jesus had to explain to people that his teaching was not meant to abolish the law and the prophets because much of what he said in to some degree contradicted the Old Testament law because it went beyond the Old Testament law. And so we looked at that in the last video. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into verse 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or one mark will pass from the law until all be fulfilled. So oftentimes when this is interpreted, whether it be by um, some dispensationalists or by almost every Hebraic roots, in fact, I, th I think every Hebraic roots uh, proponent would say that what Jesus is saying here is that I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I came to teach them. I came to bring commentary on them. I came to tell you how to obey the law of Moses. Uh, for uh, uh, truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or one mark will pass from the law until all be fulfilled. So heaven and earth uh, is not going to pass away. Our, our, the law is not going to pass away, but it's still going to be binding on everybody's soul that they must obey it until heaven and earth pass away, or at least until heaven and earth pass away. So we have to ask, is that what the passage is saying? And of course, it's not. If we read the words, we've got to read carefully what Jesus is saying. He said that, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. That's not just the law of Moses, but also the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And he goes on, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or one mark will pass from the law until all be fulfilled, or some versions will say all be accomplished. And so here what we see is that Jesus is saying that he's going to, in some way, fulfill the law. That's different than just teaching the law or telling us to obey the law. He's talking about a prophetic fulfillment. When we talk about the word fulfill, we're talking about that there was some sort of promise. There was some sort of, in the Old Testament, pointing to something and that he was going to bring that to pass. So there's something in the old that is pointing to something that's going to come, and he's saying that he is going to bring that to pass. And so in that sense, he's not contradicting the law. He's not uh, opposed to the law. He's not against the Old Testament. He's not coming and saying, forget the Old Testament law. I've got something new for you. No, he's saying, I do have something new for you, but it was pointed to by the law and the prophets. Just as Jesus said to the Pharisees in John chapter 5, he says, in, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life. That's the Old Testament scriptures. But they point to me and you refuse to come to me that you might have life because the Old Testament scriptures were prophesying about Jesus Christ and his coming, filling the law and the prophets. Um, I noted in the last video that there's different ways that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament in general. Uh, we see some things that are pictures in the Old Testament. For example, the Passover lamb being sacrificed, the blood being put on the doorposts. And we know that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he is our Passover lamb, that because of what he has done, now the blood of Jesus Christ causes the wrath of God that killed the firstborn in Egypt to pass over us so that we can have eternal life. And so he's fulfilled it in that sense through creation. So we see that the... Jesus fulfills the law in various aspects. He fulfills the, you know, the, the sacrifices and the feasts and the Sabbaths. Uh, he fulfills the, the, the Passover and, and many things from the Old Testament. He fulfills by his salvation, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his, inter, uh, his interceding for us at the right hand of God. All these things are fulfilled in the work and life of Jesus Christ. But in this passage... Jesus is talking about uh, being fulfilled in a different way, and we're going to see that from his own teaching. But in this, Jesus, what he's about to teach in the Sermon on the Mount, he's already started the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, and now he, in verse 17, he's, he's going to switch gears and focus more on the commands of the Old Testament. He's going to say, you've heard it said, do not commit murder, but I tell you this. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you this. And that is one of the reasons, as we noted in the last video, why he... 
pointed out, don't think that I've came to abolish the law because he's going to say things uh, different than the law. He's going to say something different. He's going to say the law says this, but I tell you this. So when we see that, we understand that what he's talking about fulfilling the law is a little bit different than through his death, burial, and resurrection, through his uh, salvation that he brings us. But he's talking about the righteous standards of the Old Testament. The moral standards of the Old Testament will be fulfilled in his commands. So when we look to the Old Testament, there are certain things that were righteous. Do not commit adultery. Okay. So Jesus said, do not lust after a woman uh, or you will commit adultery in your heart. So if we obey the law of Christ, we will fulfill that Old Testament moral command, do not commit adultery, but we'll go much further than it, than that Old Testament command. If we were to go to the Old Testament command, do not commit adultery, but we had several wives, we got divorced a couple times, we wrote a certificate of divorce. In that case, we wouldn't be breaking the law of Moses, we wouldn't be breaking the, the Ten Commandments, but we would be breaking the law of Christ because the law of Christ is the actual fulfillment of what was only a picture in the Old Testament. So here, uh, if we jump to Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus tells us, after he's gotten done talking about these moral commands uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, then he says this in verse 12, Therefore, so his conclusion, Therefore, everything you would like men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So by saying this is the law and prophets, he's referring back to what he said in verse 17. Do not think that I have came to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So his teaching of doing to others as you would have them do unto you, that fulfills the righteous requirements, the, the moral standards of the Old Testament and goes beyond it. But it fulfills what it was pointing to. Because he said, therefore, everything you would like men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law of and the prophets. This fulfills the law and the prophets, the moral standard of the law and the prophets. Uh, if we jump over to Matthew chapter 22, chapter 22, verse 38. Okay, he says this, uh, starting in verse 34. When the Pharisees heard, he silenced the Sadducees. They came together. One of them who was a lawyer tested him by asking, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Okay? So again, notice that, Paul, uh, that, that Jesus is not merely talking about the law. He's not nearly talking, merely talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the law and the prophets. The moral teachings that are found in the law and the prophets are fulfilled if we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors ourselves. So if we want to know what is the law of Christ, you know, in First, uh, in, in first Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20 through 21, we're told that we're not under the law of Moses, but we are under the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? If we sum it up, it's this, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbors yourself. Now, let me point out something here about the Sermon on the Mount. If we, uh, many people will say, well, the Sermon on the Mount was just written to show us that we can't do that. In other words, the Sermon on the Mount was written and we're not able to fulfill it. That shows us that we need a savior. And so it's not meant to be obeyed. It's just meant to show us that we can't obey it. Show us that we are sinners. That's not what Jesus commands. In fact, if we look to Matthew at the end of his sermon, the very closing of his sermon says, Matthew chapter seven, verse 23 through 27 says this, those that hear my words and put them into practice are like a wise man who built his house on a rock. When the judgment comes, they will stand. But if a man uh, hears my words and does not put them into practice, he's like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the winds and the waves and the uh, crash against that house, great will be the fall of it. In other words, there will be great judgment on that man. So Jesus intended his words to be obeyed. So when, when somebody argues, oh, no, no, the Sermon on the Mount is not meant to be obeyed, what they're saying is that, look, nobody can obey that perfectly, and so obviously Jesus doesn't me mean that as a standard. It's true that we cannot obey it perfectly, but Jesus does not command us to obey it perfectly. He commands us to obey it. And so we can see this when we flip to Matthew chapter 5. 
It talks about the first one, uh, verse 21. You have heard that it was said by the ancients, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in the danger of Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So we say, well, nobody could ever live that out perfectly. True enough, but Jesus acknowledges that and he goes on. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go on your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So just as in the Old Testament law, it was not meant to be everything done perfectly because in the Old Testament law, there were still sacrifices that could be made for cleansing. Uh, whenever somebody was unclean, they could be cleansed through certain uh, washings, through certain sacrifices. In the same way, in the New Testament command, the law of Jesus Christ, it's not given in a sense that it has to be obeyed perfectly, otherwise you're going to hell. Because here, Jesus says, if you realize that you've stumbled in some point, here's what you do. You go and be reconciled to your brother. Uh, we see it again if we jump over to verse 27. Chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said by the ancients, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever lo looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already. Okay, well, who has not done that? So you've already failed the perfect standard. No. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away, for it is profitable that one of your members should perish and that your whole body, and that your whole, instead of that your whole body, be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, Throw it away, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body be thrown into hell. So he's saying, if you have this sin, if you fall into this sin, if you're tempted in this way, then deal with it. Uh, deal with the temptations, the things that are tempting you to sin. Get away from that. You need to arrange your life in such a way that you walk in obedience to this command. Again, not perfect obedience. So people will say, but how can we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? That just means that today, with all of my focus, with all of my energy, I'm seeking to love God. Are there areas that I'm ignorant of in my life? Are there attitudes maybe that are lurking deep below that I am not fulfilling perfectly? Yes, but it's not about per fulfilling it perfectly. It's about fulfilling it uh, willingly, about obeying, about living according to this. So I want us to understand the Sermon on the Mount was given to be obeyed. If someone tells you it was only given as a hypothetical to show us that we are sinners, it does indeed show us that we are sinners. It does indeed show us the standard of God so that we acknowledge that we have fallen short and so that we come to the Savior. But when we come to the Savior to find rest, we also find a yoke that we put his yoke, his law upon us. And that yoke is easy and that load is light because he who believes in Jesus Christ has overcome the world and those that love God, his commands are not burdensome to them, as it says in 1 John. So when we come uh, to the law of Jesus Christ, it is to be obeyed. It is not expected that we will obey it perfectly, but it is expected that this will be our standard for living and that by patience and continuance in doing good, living according to this law, as Paul says in Romans chapter 2, that we will inherit eternal life as we don't only come through the narrow gate, but then we walk on the narrow road that leads to life. This narrow road is walking with Jesus Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and we must cling to him. This is why Hebrews chapter 5, 9 says, he is the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So we come and we submit to his law, though we don't do it perfectly. So his law is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, this is not only Jesus that says this, but if we can, uh, that he fulfills the, the Old Testament moral standards or righteous standards, we can see this also if we flip to uh, Paul. Romans chapter 2, verse 26. Let's start in verse 25. Circum circumcision indeed has merit if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteousness of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Now, this is a strange thing. How can you keep the law when you don't obey circumcision? Because circumcision was given as part of the law of Moses. So what is Paul saying here? Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteousness of the law, that is the moral standards and the righteous requirements of the law of Moses, those things that were foreshadowing the law of Christ in the Old Testament, those moral standards. If we walk according to that, then God will be pleased, even though we don't walk according to the law of Moses, circumcision, Sabbaths, uh, feast days, you know, uh, ceremonial uh, uh, washings, uh, clean and unclean foods. That is not the point that we're living by. Now think of it this way. Imagine in the Old Testament, if you read the prophets, the prophets will often say something like, 
I hate your new moons and your Sabbaths. I hate your uh, sacrifices. Who commanded you to give these to me? And he says, instead, do justly, walk humbly, love mercy. Why won't you do this? Until you do that, all these things are nothing to me. So in other words, he's saying that there is a righteousness that God always required of people about justice, about humility, about love, about kindness. Uh, Jesus said the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and, and love. And so we see this written in the prophets. But now can you ever imagine the prophet saying, who cares about your honesty and your integrity and your humility and your justice and your mercy to the poor. But give me your Sabbaths. Give me your sacrifices. Until you give me your sacrifices and your Sabbaths, I care nothing for your honesty and your humility. We would never imagine seeing that because even in the Old Testament, in the prophets, there was an acknowledgement. There was a different standard of law. So we see that there has always been a righteous standard uh, we can also see this in the fact that in the Old Testament, if you found a nation like Babylon or a nation like Persia or these nations, they were never, uh, they were never punished because they were not obeying Sabbath or because they were not, uh, you know, keeping kosher food. They were punished because of violence, because of immorality, because of the things that are fulfilled in the law of Christ. We see it again if we turn over to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, Paul says this, verse 8, Owe, nothing any, owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves has another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not covet. And if there are any other commandments are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no evil to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You'll notice whenever these kind of lists are given, and they refer to the Ten Commandments, that he always refers to the moral commandments that are given in the Ten Commandments. And he says that love will fulfill these. Love, the law of Christ, will go beyond these, and so will never break these things. So love is the fulfillment of the law, to love God and to love your neighbor. If we flip over to uh, Galatians chapter 5, he teaches the same thing. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 13, you brothers have been called to liberty. Liberty, we're, we're no longer under the, the laws of what we eat and what we taste and of ceremonial washings and of uh, festival days. We're no longer under that. We're under a law of liberty that now by the Spirit of God, we walk in the righteous standards and moral uh, standards of God. Verse 13, you have, brothers have been called to liberty. In other words, you're not under the law of Moses. Only do not use, the, use liberty to give an opportunity to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. For the entire law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love, again, fulfills the law. It doesn't teach the law that you, you have to obey the Sabbaths, that you need to go keep the festivals, that you need to go to Passover, go to Jerusalem, to a temple that's not there and sacrifice according to Deuteronomy chapter 16. No, you don't have to do that, but you do have to keep the righteous requirements of the law by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is summed up in love God and love your neighbor. We do need to walk in that. Not perfectly, but we need to walk in it. So we have a, we're have under the law of mercy that we show mercy, we show grace, we show love to others, and we're going to be judged according to that law of liberty, that we walk according to the Spirit of God, loving God and loving our neighbor. This is the law of liberty. This is the law of Christ. It fulfills all the moral requirements of the Old Testament and goes beyond them. If you walk according to the moral requirements of the Old Testament, for example, if you uh, do not commit adultery, but you have more than one wife. If you do not commit adultery, but you divorce, you write a certificate of divorce and your wife marries another man, and Jesus said that would be adultery under the law of Christ. But in the law of Moses, you could do that freely. In the law of Moses, you could swear an oath. As long as you keep your oath, you can swear an oath in the name of the Lord. Jesus said to swear at all is of the evil one. So you would be breaking the law of Christ if you walk in what is allowed in the law of Moses. So the law of Christ is the fulfillment of the righteous standards, the moral requirements of the Old Testament. We are not a lawless people. Christians are not without law. We have the law of Christ. In closing, let's look at Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 5, or 7, verse 21. This is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount and the judgment that is to come. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. The will of the Father is to obey the Son.
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? They're saying they've got, they've got charismatic gifts. They're doing uh, charismatic things. They're involved in ministry. But I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice evil. The word here is lawlessness. Those that practice lawlessness will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ will reject them because in the kingdom of God, there is a standard of righteousness that is higher than the Old Testament standard. In the Old Testament, they did not have the spirit of God, so they could not walk according to it. But in the New Testament, we have the spirit of God, so we can put sin to death by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can walk in the law of God, not perfectly, but consistently continuing continuing in good as Paul says in Romans chapter 2. I hope this has been helpful to clarify for you that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament law and the prophets. The righteous standards in the Old Testament law and prophets pointed to the law of Jesus Christ, and he fulfills it, the law of loving God and loving your neighbor. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.